Good morning, Clear Branch. Oh, I hope you guys are well. Jenny and the boys and I have spent a few days away, and it was wonderful, and we thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, as Mark mentioned, we had a great turnout at, at Pub Theology last week. It was amazing. There were 55 of us outside, and there were another six or seven inside, and a lot of them were workers or family members of workers, and every time I walked inside, they wanted to stop and talk about what it was we were doing there. They wanted to ask questions about Clear Branch. They wanted to ask about how it was that a church came um, to show up at a local brewery and uh, to fellowship and to share together. And um, I promise you, if you have reservation about that, there was no silliness or ridiculous, ridiculousness there. I mean, we had a good time. We talked a lot. But um, our intent everywhere we go is to be recognizable as emissaries of the one true king. And so uh, I invite you to come out with us next week. I think it'll be an awesome opportunity. And uh, I realize not for everybody, and that's perfectly fine. But if you've been interested in seeing what it's all about, come check it out. Um, we had some wonderful conversations with people who would have never come to Clear Branch, but who were absolutely willing to come to Steel Hall. And so what a blessing that was. While we were there, I had a conversation with a gentleman who, who often comes in and out of this congregation. He's not a member here. He's a member at another church, but he, 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 he gives me a lot of encouragement, uh, texts me on a regular basis, and, and, and shows up on Sunday mornings. And um, He came to me and he said, Jeremy, I watched your emotion this morning. I just want to make sure you're okay, that, you have, um, that, that you're not you know, being overcome by um, the emotion of things. And I said, oh, no, I'm, I'm fine, I, you know, as fine as I can be. And, and, and I think that... Um, what I, what I would say is I've had more time to think about that in response, and I say it to you, um, is that we are intended to celebrate when members of our family celebrate. And we're intended to mourn when members of this family mourn. That is the nature of what it means to walk through life with people and to help them carry both the joys that they experience and the hardships that they encounter. It's what leads us to come forward at these altars on Sunday morning and to pray together because we have faith that the people who join us are with us in that place and that they are representing Jesus in the midst of those situations. And so God is active and present and at work in the midst of this community and in the midst of the community outside of these doors. And for that, I am tremendously grateful. God is so good. Now, I do want to share a couple of things with you, or at least one specific thing with you before we jump in too far this morning. Um, guys, you might remember, I'd share with you guys several, uh, I guess two months ago now, a month and a half ago now, um, that we had gone from October through uh, April and had seen just, you know, absolutely amazing uh, blessing show up that we had been meeting the the need and expectation of what the church had for budget in terms of giving, um, that we had not had, we had not missed a beat. It was just amazing. Um, and, and then two weeks ago, we had Memorial Day and, and summer begins and people begin to go out and do their things. Listen, I just got back from vacation. I want you to go and vacation. What I don't want you to do is to forget that we are intended to be faithful. Because in the past two weeks, we've received about half what we are expecting in terms of budget. And I don't tell you that to scare you. Listen, we've had an unbelievable year. I tell you that to say, don't forget what it is that we commit to in terms of prayers and presence and gifts and service and witness. And this is not merely about tithe and offering. It's about our commitment to be present in the church, to pray for others in this place, right? To serve, not only within the context of these walls, but outside of these walls. And to witness to God's goodness and God's grace in the midst of our lives, wherever we may be. Because we, we do those things Quite frankly, because we have a hope and an expectation that the way that we are reflective of God, reflective of Jesus, empowered and emboldened by the Holy Spirit, means that we have a lineage, that we have a legacy that goes far beyond anything that's rooted to our human years. And if you've only been here this morning, I, I want to tell you that we're in the middle of a series, the end of a series actually, called Generations, and we've looked at a lot of things. We've talked about what it is that we can learn from those who have come before us. Maybe the things that we shouldn't learn from the ones who came before us. And today, we're going to talk about what it means to pass down things to future generations. To understand that the blessings that we experience are not merely blessings for us, but they're intended to be a blessing for those who come after us. 
for our children and our children's children. And the root of this comes out of Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. So if you will join me and stand for the reading of God's holy and precious word, it'll be on the screens behind me. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You guys may be seated. I wonder what your answers would be if we sat down across from each other, maybe at Pub Theology, and I asked you this question. What will the people that come after you and your family have to say about you? For some of you, that might be terrifying, right? For instance, if you were to ask that of me, they might say, well, he's that bearded guy who was a preacher. I hope they say more than that. I hope that they would say that I'm someone who blessed them, not merely because I was a pastor and it's my job, but because I was a father that loved my boys and they learned how to love as a result of that. That I was a husband who loved my wife and cherished her and honored her and that as a result of that, they would learn to do the same thing. I would also hope that on some level that, that when I leave this earth, that there'd be something beyond me, not just in the words that I've spoken or the life that I live that would be tangible for them in the years ahead. Sometimes we think about that in terms of like an inheritance. And oftentimes we hear the word inheritance and we think, well, that means it's some type of a monetary thing. Certainly, yeah, that can be part of it. But money loses value. And, and the material things are only short term. The inheritance that we leave with others can be that, but it also needs to be a spiritual inheritance. It needs to be a, a place where our family members and our friends, the people that we are engaged in life with who join us at these altars, but also those who never show up to this church, are able to say that we had left with them an understanding and a clarity planting a seed of God's goodness and grace within them. And I wonder if we're doing that. I wonder if we are really focused on what it means to make a difference in the lives of those around us, to invest in a future that's more than just monetary, but instead to invest in a future that's spiritual. Because that is of an unbelievable level of importance. You see, when we encounter Abram in this series, in this, in this moment, in Genesis chapter 12, we, we wind up in a place that's a little different than where we experienced him previously. Earlier, we talked about maybe the things that Abram got wrong, right, in, in our last series, and how God worked even in the midst of the stuff that Abram did wrong. But I want us to consider that, that God had brought him out of this place where his family has existed, Ur of the Chaldeans, by the way, not a, a Jewish stronghold in the Old Testament, right? This was prior to there being Hebraic understanding. And he calls him out of this pagan society and he says, this guy, he's being faithful. He may not even realize the faithfulness that he's experiencing or the blessing that he's going to receive, but I'm going to call him out of that place. I'm going to take him somewhere else so that he can be refined, so that he can experience my promise, so that he can be the progenitor of nations, and you might remember from our last series when that happened, Abram and Sarai had no idea that it would come to fruition. They took a lot of responsibility on their own. They attempted to force the possibility of having children through Hagar, and they wound up in a mess as a result of that. And yet God promised them that he would be present and active, and he was. You see, in Abram's life, as he's called to go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, he begins to be a person that we're able to see evidence of God's faithfulness in. And we're also able to see what it looks like to respond in faith. Because God calls him and he offers to bless him in the midst of this structure of Scripture. And Abram leaves his family and leaves his home he goes where God leads him to be. And I wonder if we would do the same thing. If God shot, showed up to you and he spoke to you and he said, listen, I've got something else for you. 
Would you be willing to set aside the comfort and the experience of your life in this moment and go where God leads? You see, most of us have this mindset that that we can experience God's blessing and his promise just fine right here from the couch or the chair in worship. And yet in order for us to truly be the hands and the feet of Jesus, we have to be willing to take our bottoms out of the seats and go into a world that needs to hear it. We have to be willing to share what it is that God has done in and through the promises he has offered, that he has given, that he has brought to fulfillment. And that faithful response on our part, in the midst of difficulty and in the midst of struggle and in the midst of being called to places sometimes that are uncomfortable, allows us to show what faithfulness looks like from our side of the equation. And so Abram, being called, leaves. He trades the known for the unknown. But in that moment, Though it was unknown to Abram what God had in store, God knew what was to come. And when God calls us to be responsive, when he calls us to be reactive, when he calls us to make a difference, when he empowers us through his blessing to bless others, then we are intended to do exactly, exactly what he calls us to do. To not hesitate, to not wait, to not drag our feet, to not go to the other city like Jonah, Nineveh, Tarshish kind of thing, but instead to be faithful. So why is faithfulness so hard for us? Why is it so difficult for us to to believe that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of the nations, the God who continues to pour out his blessing upon us, the God who sends his son to live and to die and to be resurrected so that one day we may be brought into the kingdom of God, so that one day we may help to bring the kingdom of God to fruition on earth as it is in heaven? If we believe what it is that we say we believe, then why do we struggle so hard to be faithful? Not rhetorical. Why do we struggle? Bueller? Anybody? It's not immediate. Oh, is that Mary Golden? get a star i don't have any but if i had one you'd get a star high fives okay mary says because sometimes it's not immediate Ooh, absolutely any other thoughts immediacy is a problem what else why do we struggle to be faithful oh distraction right yeah for sure things look better somewhere else what's that selfish oh man you guys are thank you for doing the heavy lifting y'all are good Ooh, yeah, intimidation. I think that's what you said. Fear, yeah. Oh, it's not the answer you want. Yeah, that's for sure. You guys are giving great answers. I, I appreciate your feedback. It probably won't be the first time in, or the last time that you see that happen. I know it's not the first time you've seen it happen. See, we have a real struggle because God makes us promises And it's like if it doesn't happen in the way that we expect it to happen, we somehow think that God's promise has gone null and void. Like he promised Abraham to be like a father of nations and Abraham's like, I've got one son and you're sending me to a a mountain to offer him as a sacrifice. Now we know that that didn't happen. Abraham and Isaac come back. But we also realize that you don't really get the full sense of what it is to be those nations until you get to... Jacob, who becomes Israel, and even then, it's kind of finite, comparatively speaking. But the blessing that God was bringing to fulfillment in what he provided to Abraham comes to fruition in God's timing. And God's timing and God's plan and God's purpose are perfect. See, what I would argue that points to is that God promises blessing, but those blessings, we have to be aware of how outside of our control it is for them to come to fruition. We get a real sense of 
of what it looks like in first century culture to understand this promise to Abraham. Paul writes about it in the book of Hebrews 11, 8, and 9, and he says this, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. God made a promise to Abraham and brought it to fruition over time. And the only way that that could be seen as coming to full fruition is if we're willing to look at what he did in the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and throughout the lineage of time, throughout the lives of unbelievable numbers of people where God's blessing matriculated trickled down and made a difference in their lives. Paul got that. And he understood that it was an inheritance, but it was an inheritance that paid out over time. He understood that it was an example of faithfulness and it was God's faithfulness, but it was also an opportunity for us to look back and say, man, Abram was faithful too because he left what was known for the unknown. See, God promises blessings to us. But he does work in his own timing. In Genesis 12, 2, it says, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your, great, make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Now catch this, it gets kind of difficult sometimes for us to see it clearly. He said, I will make of you a great nation. We get stuck on great nation. We think, oh, this is a big deal. He's gonna be, there's going to be a lot of people and he's going to be the father of those. They call him Father Abraham. Had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. There, you guys have been asking me to sing. You got it. I'll do better, I promise. But it wasn't just about being a nation. It was about so much more than that. It was about the realization that they will what? That they will be a blessing. So where have you experienced God's blessing? Like if you look back over the course of your years, whether they're like 10 years or 100, where do you see God's blessing most palpably recognizable or present? Maybe it's in the children you've had or the job that you've you've, you've been able to work in. Maybe it's in the spouse that God has given you. Maybe it's in a thousand different places, whatever it may be. That blessing is intended for you, but that blessing is also intended to be something that you offer up as a mechanism for God to be glorified. I'd ask the group this morning, it's kind of that idea. Like we think about blessings differently, I think, than the, the people in the Old Testament did. Abraham was like, I'm going to be a father of nations, lots of children, yay. Maybe we would have the same experience if it was like, God's going to give you a million dollars instead of a million children. And you'd be like, oh my gosh, a million dollars. But would you use that to honor God? Or would you find a way to rationalize the utilization of God's blessing for your purpose and your pleasure instead of God's purpose and God's glory? Radically different. Also, probably revealing of who we are when we start thinking about blessing in the monetary sense more so than we do in like the spiritual sense. God works in both of those places and he desires for us to be faithful with the way that we utilize both of those blessings. There's no doubt about it. But it's very clear here that God is calling us to utilize the blessing that he gives us so that others may understand that God is a God of promise. And so that maybe we can be recognizable as people who carry that promise and offer it out as blessing to others. God's promise motivates Abraham to enter into a relationship of trust and obedience. In fact, um, you wind up seeing this in in Christina Bond's book. Um, She wrote the book of Genesis 12. It's it's, it's a commentary on Genesis 12 through Genesis 50. And um, she ultimately says that the promises given to Abraham at various occasions include a son and land and descendants, including nations and kings, covenant and blessings in God's presence. 
I think that evidence is that like, we look at this and we think that Abraham's blessing is in either the promised land that's promised or maybe it's in the sons that he receives. But, but do we think about it being so much more than that? That, yeah, it's the son and the land, but it's also descendants and covenant and blessing and presence and, and being someone who, who gets to live out a life that's being directed by God, not merely called out of Ur and sent to the promised land, but ultimately sent to Egypt and then brought back again, all these different things. See, what I would argue is that most times when we receive and experience God's blessing, we take it for granted or we completely and utterly miss it. Because we have an expectation that God's blessing will be one thing. And way more frequently, it is many things. And way more frequently, it occurs in places that are difficult and sometimes painful. That God's blessing comes in the midst of loss and brokenness as much as it comes in the midst of abundance. We have to have eyes that are willing to see that. That even in the places where we fail or fall short, we attempt to establish our own plan that God is present and working. And that work that he's doing is intended to bring about redemption and restoration to the entirety of creation. So maybe the greater question to ask today is what are you doing with the blessing that God's provided you that makes it clear that God is working to redeem and to restore the entirety of his creation? A lot of implications there. And a much broader span for us to consider, like how is the blessing we receive making a difference in the world outside these doors. See, the amazing thing about God is that when he promises blessing, you started seeing glimpses of this. It's not just about one blessing, but it's about blessings upon blessings. It's about blessings that are passed down again and again that we see throughout the lives of these biblical patriarchs and matriarchs whose lives are transformed never to be the same again as a result of God's goodness and God's grace. And it goes so far beyond their immediate context and immediate family. Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I'm confident there's somebody in this room saying, well, that was a promise just for Abraham. But the blessing was promised for us all. The blessings we receive to this day come from the one true God. And whether or not God calls us out of our own Ur of the Chaldeans to go into some new promised land, or God simply calls us to be faithful where we are, the blessing we receive is connected to the very first blessing that was offered. And truly rooted in those early covenants. I'll be your God, you be my people. I'll call you out of this place and you go this other place and I'm going to be your God. It's going to be okay. I think we forget that. Sometimes I think we're so busy looking for a new covenant that we forget the beauty and the power and the sufficiency of the new covenant of Christ. And of the fulfillment that that brings to all of the covenants that came before It's as though we think our experience of blessing has to be so over the top and abundant that um, if we just had more, we'd be able to, to, to do everything that we need to do. And sometimes I get that mindset. I do. But we also have to be a people that are willing to utilize what it is that God gives us with the understanding that that investment is about more than just today. And I'm not just referencing materialistic blessings either. In the first week of the series, we talked about the lineage of Jesus. And in that moment, as Matthew wrote about that lineage, he calls him a son of David and a son of Abraham. 
The blessing that God had in store for the nations wasn't merely about offspring and herds. It wasn't just about some form of monetary, uh, you know, uh, valuable thing, commodity. Instead, it was about salvation that's brought to its climax. It's a fulfillment in Jesus Christ. We get Jesus through this original blessing that goes to Abraham. And that's the blessing that means the most of all of them. Because it's in and through Jesus that we have the opportunity to set aside our sinfulness and our brokenness and take on his offered righteousness, not because we deserve it, but because of God's unbelievable love. And maybe that's the thing we need to see more clearly. Whether we're looking at the example of Abram, who becomes Abraham, or we're looking at you know, Jacob, who becomes Israel, or, or we're looking at Matthew, or wherever it may be, these people that we see in Scripture are intended to highlight to us that God's plan and purpose is constantly at work. And that His greatest blessing is His love and His grace and His redemptive and sacrificial offering of Jesus. Again, Paul, I think, recognizes this as well as anybody as he writes to the church in Galatia. Chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, he says this. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul understood this blessing to be about redemption, for this blessing to be rooted in the ability for us to set aside all of the things that cause us to struggle and to wrestle and to have faith that God's plan and purpose are greater and that God's true promise, his ultimate promise, and the redemption of creation is made possible through the blood of Christ. And see, here's where I think that the rubber really begins to hit the road. Maybe we need to live like we believe this. Maybe we need to place our faith in the fact that God has always met need, that God has always shown up, but that God has used the people who he called out of darkness to be the conduit by which others heard that truth. I think sometimes we see ourselves as so limited. We compare the blessing we've received with the blessings others may have. We, we compare our experiences with the experience of, of those next to us or across the street or on the next aisle. And if you don't take anything away from this message today, I pray that you hear these words and you take this. When God made you, he knew exactly how he would bless you. And he intended you to use that. To use it as a mechanism to give him glory and honor and to use your place and your status in life as a means by which others may come to know him. We have to be a people that do not squander God's blessing. And that do not waste it away because we're so caught up in the fact that someone else received something different than we did. That we miss the fact that God's blessing for us was perfect and intended for us. So may we be a people that are content with God's blessing. But may we also be a people that are constantly experiencing the urging of the Holy Spirit within us to not merely think about the blessing as being ours and ours alone, but to seek ways that we can use it to be a blessing to others so that they may see God more clearly in and through us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing that you provide. 
We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for the blessing you provided Abraham and that you bring even to fruition to this day. And Father, we ask that you would help us not to squander that which you give us, but to use it to bring you honor and glory. To use the places that we go and the people that we encounter, the situations we may find ourselves in, to your glory every single day. Help us to focus less on us and more on you. Help us to use what you give us to the greatest of our ability and the greatest of your glory. Allow us to move in faith as you are faithful and to remember that we do not walk alone. In Christ's name we pray, amen.